Hey everyone, David Corsini, co-chair of the Young Professionals Network with NCJAR. Uh, we wanted to host a webinar for all of our supporters and all of the NCJAR members uh, on how to list your house during COVID-19. We have two very special guests, Bill Boswell and Michelle Pice. And between them, just during COVID with listings and under contracts, only since COVID started, they're at about 50 transaction guys. So we have a lot of information coming for you. So don't look away. Gavin, you can start the questions. Bill, Michelle, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, how does your sales volume compare at this time now compared to the same time last year? Yeah, so COVID happened during the spring market and the spring market has always been our busiest. Um, although we are still very busy, uh, we are about 50% um, uh, of, of about 50 difference in production from last year to this year. And it's mostly because people are just holding off. So it's not that they are not listing their homes or thinking about selling their homes. A lot of them just are, are skeptical and are nervous. And so we're getting the appointments and we're getting, you know, people are just on hold as of right now. Yeah, first of all, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. I, I happen to love your accent. So that is, uh, that's an amazing asset you got there. I've been trying to work on that for a long time. Um, so in comparison to uh, last year, uh, unit wise, we're down uh, somewhere in the 25% range. So at this point last year, we were in the 80s on units. And right now we're in the, we're in the 60s. Ironically enough, our volume um, is actually up a little bit. So we've had some larger transactions that have taken place to kind of fill fill that gap. So from, um, from a unit perspective, there's certainly little ground to make up. Um, I agree 100% with, with Michelle that what we're experiencing isn't necessarily a, a loss of business, but more so just a, a push down the road a little bit. Um, so I, I believe we're in a, one of those industries where um, we'll be able to make up for some of the lost business, right? As opposed to, to a hotel that the, the room was vacant that night and that's gone. Um, uh, one positive and something we should all be grateful for in our business is we still have um, a good portion of this year left to make up for those unit counts or volume counts. And that a lot of people who entered this year, the majority I feel, who said we need to sell something in 2020 are still gonna sell in 2020. And the majority of the people that said I need to buy in 2020 are still gonna buy. It just might be a shifting, uh, shifting time frame. Okay. Bill, I'll start the second question over to you. How has your prospecting changed since the lockdown? Uh, and what's your number one source for, for client acquisition? Yeah, so um, this is something we've talked through a ton um, at the brokerage level. So I also um, own a brokerage. It's been really um, important since inception of, of the issues and challenges we've been experiencing to, to shift the way we go about the origination of business. And that, in my mind, is more or less don't focus on the origination of the business. Focus on the deepening of the relationships. Um, so we, we've been hearing a lot about that, but um, the, the key right now in the consumer's mindset um, is still safety focused. It was a lot worse a couple of weeks ago. Um, we have seen that curve start to, to flatten out from the consumer perspective and level of comfortability and proceeding to what was before their goals. So if this was two weeks ago, my answer to that question would be pretty simply, just focus on deep in relationship, deep in relationship, deep in relationship. All of my calls were care calls. Just checking in, see if you need anything. I know there's been a lot of challenges, you know, um, is, is there anything that I can help? We have access to a bunch of resources that I'd be more than willing to, um, you know, to assist you with. Um, it's transitioned a little bit in the last week, beginning um, last Friday, I really felt it necessary to pass along that that transition in the consumer mindset is beginning to happen. It's still at a point where we have to focus on keeping the safety first uh, mantra and meaning behind it. But we're now in a position to reconnect people to what their dreams and wishes were before this all started. If that conversation does not naturally go there, my suggestion is, continue to work on deepening that relationship because you can always open that door again in two weeks, in a month when that person is ready. Everybody's different right now. 
So I have been really successful right now in just putting out a lot of content. So that right now would be my number one source is just education. Um, I did a video not too long ago about, you know, the number one mistake sellers are doing right now. Now this isn't a sales video. This is basically offering information. You know, I predict that, um, in the next couple, I would say a month, a month and a half, when everything starts to slow down and, and everything opens up again, you're going to see a lot of inventory at the market. So you have all these sellers that um, were either thinking of putting their home on the market but held off or were on the market and took it off. And then all the other sellers that are just, you know, panic sellers and just waiting uh, for this to slow down so they can put their home on the market. What's gonna happen with that is, is now we're gonna create um, too much competition and we all know with too much competition what happens the prices start to come down so my advice to sellers is that listen if you're trying to capitalize if you're trying to get as much money as you can for your home consider listing your house now because there is not a lot of inventory so what i'm experiencing right now is that there are a lot of buyers on the market in the market looking for homes but they're just not there's not a lot of homes out there so what does that mean we are starting to see things you know sell quicker just because in my opinion there's just not that much to pick from but um, understand that, you know, it's, it's just common sense. It's supply and demand. Um, so I have also found that those that are listing their homes up for sale now, those that are nervous, we have ways of, um, you know, calming their nerves. I mean, we're digital marketing experts. So, and I guess this is the next question, which you're going to ask that, but, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but for those that are nervous, we're, there are ways that we're, there are things that we're doing to get homes sold. Um, using the safest precautions. And one other advice right now, I'm just letting everyone that has a vacant home that's on them that are think that they're thinking of selling their home is vacant. These are the sellers that really should put their up their home up there because it's vacant. It's easy access. The content, um, uh, the contact contact is less and uh, it's just safer. So, you know, a lot of education videos, um, as far as the marketing and prospecting, Honestly, I have not slowed down. I think during these times, a lot of real estate agents start to just kind of put the brakes on their marketing and just, you know, they either just put their, put their head in the sand and just are just waiting. And I'm not one of them. I'm actually doubling down at every, all my efforts, I'm doubling down. I think now is a time where, you know, in order to be, to make the same amount of money that you've made in the past, you're going to have to work a lot harder, right? So double down, keep, keep, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, I've, I've actually doubled down on my marketing, but again, in a different approach. So it's not of a, you know, here, you know, I'm not posting, look at all these homes I sold, rah, rah, rah. I'm more of, more of a coming, putting out an approach of this is how we're doing it, but let us help you. And I've been getting a tremendous positive response from that. Fantastic. Now you, you mentioned that you doubled down and, you, and you're still working as hard as you ever have. How are you conducting your listing appointments right now, Michelle? Are you doing them in person? Is it Zoom call? What are you finding the best way? Yeah, so um, the last two weeks, the listing calls have actually have gone up tremendously. So this week I have one, one to two a day. So I, have, I give people the option of either doing a virtual or an in-person. I have to say that Almost all of them want to do an in-person consultation, which I'm totally fine with that. Um, I do have a virtual one that I set up for, and um, but the majority of them want to meet. And then when they meet, listen, I'm there. We use proper, you know, um, uh, COVID-19 precautions. We're social distancing, wearing masks, and all that good stuff. So um, a lot of these sellers still want to have that personal uh, connection. They want to meet you. Um, I think it's the ones that are not in the area or out of state or, you know, those are the ones that are more open to, to Zoom call. Much like Michelle had mentioned. So um, a blend of all of the above, which I think is really important that we give, um, we give the client the option to elect what is best for them. So um, I do let them know my preference. My preference is to to get into the house, um, to at least experience it like a buyer would. Uh, sometimes it's really hard and we can miss a couple of things when we don't have that ability to experience a home and we're, you know, we're pricing just solely based off of uh, digital content, whether they're, you know, FaceTiming you or Zooming you through the house. Um, that being said, um, I'm trying to avoid as much time there as possible um, with them. So um, I, I request a, an initial walkthrough um, and then the actual 
presentation consultation part on recommending be via Zoom so that there's a lot of time and connection there um, where we can, you know, read each other's, you know, cues, body language is important. And I feel like the mask is taking a, a lot of that away. So I, my preference is to get both in, a personal touch first, followed up by the digital version. And then, um, you know, if there's any, any additionals, leave that up to them. But it's, it's important, again, at the beginning and the end of that conversation, and I say, look, I'm willing to, to meet you wherever you want to be, whatever's most comfortable for you. I have a span of clients right now who go from not wanting anybody on their lawn and try to sell this house for me completely digital, um, which we've done. Uh, and on the flip side, um, people who say, I don't care what's going on. I'm leaving town for the weekend. I want you to drive as much traffic into my house as humanly possible. Uh, and and for us as agents, I feel like at every step, we should be checking the pulse of our, our consumers and, and preparing to do our presentation, our showing schedule and all that based on where they feel is most comfortable. So I make my recommendation. Most people take my recommendation. Some people I can feel the hesitation and I'm, I'm good to run the whole thing digitally then. Michelle, have you priced a house without seeing it and how? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of those um, and mostly because people, again, are from out of state and they can't, um, they want to get their home on the market, but they're not just not available. Um, so I just had two of those um, recent uh, consultations and I've been pricing them and how have I been pricing them? So in this case, one of them, it was previously listed on the market. So I'm able to go back um, to see what the photos and what everything looks like. Um, on the second case scenario, they were actually sending me videos and walkthrough. Um, you know, listen, as far as the pricing, right, it, when you've, when you've done so many CMAs and, and, you know, mini appraisals, it's, it, it's, it's not that hard to come up with the range, right? Um, enough, but, um, I've done two and, um, you know, listen, I, I've, with, with the virtual capability, with photos, with floor plans and with them being able to just kind of do a walkthrough, it's not really hard for me to give an analysis. And I actually, you know, actually I'm enjoying that part of it, so. Yeah, I have um, on a, a few occasions, a select few. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's, it's my matter of preference, even if it's a 10 minute walkthrough just to, to experience the house. Um, I actually did one um, for uh, an, an attorney um, that had reached out and needed it for a legal matter, um, which makes it even more important to be, to be accurate there. So in, uh, in that particular situation, um, I just, I pulled every ounce of data that I possibly could. I did check out the lot, right? So I could experience the outside. Um, and I focused um, heavily on data points, um, square footage, uh, things like that. Uh, even if there's some cloudy areas, when we get into some luxury properties, um, I'll even take in the assessment to sale ratio of previous ones and where this one was assessed, if that had taken place in the last couple of years. It's a, it's a nice additional uh, touch point to check my numbers and make sure that they're clear. Um, you wouldn't have to do that in some of the lower price ranges, you know, like Michelle said, especially if you're confident in a specific area in a town. I mean, somebody can call me in, in a handful of towns and I could, I could probably come up with a pretty accurate number with, with closing my eyes and letting them tell me about the house. Um, but I, I like to, to be sure before I put anything on paper. So um, in the case of the one with the attorney, I had him video uh, each level for me separately. So just do a quick walkthrough. Don't say a word, hold your camera chest tight, make sure I don't miss anything, cover each level, um, and then give me a list of everything that he's done, upgrades and everything since, uh, since he's been in the house. And uh, just again, gather as much information that I would usually get naturally in, in my walk through the property and, uh, and work more from a data standpoint as opposed to, to a consumer experience standpoint. Bill, what is the number one objection that you're getting and how are you handling it? Um, we've used some different verbiage on the showing where we say, turn all the lights on, doors are open, buyers come in wearing booties, gloves, masks, and it is literally a no touch showing. That is the expectation. So they will not be touching um, anything. That tends to make people feel better. And we've also, uh, in certain cases with the seller's request, 
um, have um, addressed getting pre-approvals and stuff up front, which was normally something we reserve for our luxury division. In some cases where sellers have been really apprehensive, we have um, created a process where the buyer would view all digital uh, media, whether that be walkthrough video, um, Matterport, if, if we have that, which, which I've actually been steering away from lately, um, the, the photos, maybe even walk the lot and make an initial offer that's non-binding based on their digital experience. At that point, we can decide whether the person is realistic or not enough to, to bring them in, right? It could cut potentially a buyer pool of 30 down to, to three if we got the real serious buyers and it's just an initial offer, right? We don't have to negotiate this thing out. But what we want to do is weed out, maybe there's three or four families in there that are, uh, or buyers that are saying to themselves, hey, I'm going to take advantage of this market and lowball, right? So my seller doesn't want that, is concerned about that. So in a few select instances, um, we've, we've created that extra buffer where some of that offer process takes place before they even come in and experience it. And of course, they have the ability to pull that offer back. We just want to know how real they are. Um, another another um, challenge that's coming up a lot is uh, sellers concern that they might lose money by selling their property now, their home now. And um, I feel that um, from a psychology perspective, the biggest tool that we have um, is to be open and honest with everybody about both potential outcomes. Um, when we do that, natural human behavior is to pursue pleasure or avoid pain, right? Those are the two directions. And in most cases, people will elect naturally to avoid the pain before, you know, pursuing the pleasure points. So if we create a world where when someone automatically assumes that they know what the market's going to do, which we're seeing a lot, like, hey, if we sell it now, we're going to lose money as a seller. Or we have buyers um, saying, I'm going to wait because in three months, four months, prices are going to go down. Um, one, validate that, and it, it, it may be 100% true. You may be 100% correct in that assumption. Um, however, we always look at both sides, and in looking at the opposite side, what, what very well may end up happening is um, we do have, like Michelle mentioned before, an influx of inventory that comes on the market. Perhaps if unemployment becomes systemic, creates some damage to the economy, the buyer demand goes down, our supply went up, which will actually cause pricing on listings on our list side to come down and home values to come down. That's a possibility. It's also a possibility that we don't suffer systemic damage to the economy, that the buyer pools increased and less people are selling because some people who came into the year saying, I'm going to sell, have now decided not to for safety reasons. And we see pricing go up. And explaining it both sides, like, like was mentioned before, and giving an educational approach you, you watch people's minds open to something they haven't considered before. Many, many people I talked to didn't consider for one second, uh, this, is, this is especially heavy on the buyer side, I'm working with some of my team members with, that the buyers didn't even consider the fact that pricing may go up, like waiting could actually cost them. So the only thing we know is what the market gives us right now and what we're dealing with right now. And in explaining both sides, as I mentioned before, people's natural decision-making, and there's always exceptions, but the majority of people are gonna pick what they most don't want, the pain, and they're gonna decide to go in the opposite direction. So if they hear both of those scenarios, and if one of those scenarios might be waiting and the market now going down and then losing money, um, there's a good chance they will decide to make a move in that market. At the end of the day, you finish both of those with saying, whichever you decide, I'm in full support of you. However, it's always my job as a professional to educate you on all possible outcomes, which at this point could all be realistic. And then they have all the information they need to make the decision that's best for them, not you. And you've educated them to the point where if they do decide to wait, you're going to get that at bat in a, you know, three months, nine months, a year anyway. Um, but just to wrap up that thought, I've discovered uh, at a really high level through this by, by showing people both sides, even if the other side isn't what you would prefer them to do, by showing them both sides, their decision most of the time comes alongside of avoiding the, the worst case scenario for them. And you are doing them an incredible, incredible benefit by explaining to them 
what could happen in a world where a lot of other people aren't showing them both of those scenarios and they're making their real estate decisions based on what could be a situation that doesn't even take place. And the same question to you, Michelle, what's the number one objection that you're getting and how are you handling it? Yeah, number one by far is, okay, what about my safety? I live here, right? So what are you guys doing to protect us? Um, and that has been pretty much across the board. So, you know, I just tell people as of right now, if you don't feel comfortable letting people in and out, well, first and foremost, I have to say, one of the things I tell homeowners, if you have a showing during COVID-19, these buyers are serious. So one thing, um, you know, that, that one good thing that comes out of all of this craziness is that you are getting people that are walking in and that are ready to buy, right? So if you have a, a showing during this time, it, it's a serious buyer. That's number one. Number two, well, we do a buy appointments and we have some guidelines, no more than two people at a time. Um, uh, most of the sellers prefer not to have children accompany them. Um, you know, use of masks. And I tell all the sellers, make sure that you turn on all the lights, um, you leave all the doors open. Therefore, there's no, you know, contact. Um, usually the agent is the one that will wear some gloves and they'll open things up. Um, and I always, you know, tell sellers as well that once the showing is done, just for a peace of mind, come back home and just wipe everything. Wipe surfaces, wipe door uh, doorknobs, wipe, um, wipe down uh, light fixtures for their security. Um, but a lot of them also, they want to be pre-screened. So what I do is I take the initiative of when there's a, a schedule showing, I call the agent and I make sure that this buyer has seen the listing online and it's not just photos. So every listing that we have now um, is accompanied by a 3D matter port. So they can literally walk through the home as if they were there. Bill, what is the new strategy or system that you've implemented since COVID-19? Um, so the, the biggest strategy that I would drive home to everyone is flexibility, right? That is, that is one word. We, especially people who um, produce at a relatively high level, tend to be pretty particular about the way things go, right? We want things to run fluid and, and move quickly. Uh, real quick at the beginning of, of this, um, I purposefully took the time to change my mentality and say, my goal right now is to be as flexible as possible because 15 things may come up that could affect this transaction as we go along. And the solutions that I normally had or the frustration that it would normally cause me, I cannot allow to get the best of me at this point. So we have to be flexible. Um, two weeks before, I, I'm pretty sure it was two weeks before we experienced what we experienced here as far as lockdowns and stuff goes. I was in a leadership meeting at our office and I said, guys, I want us all to take a, take a couple minutes here and think about what this looks like, what our world looks like if we're not allowed to leave our house, right? Nobody, no photographer, no agent, no nobody to, to, to really try to think ahead. And I'm not going to say I'm some guru. It was actually happening in Italy, right? But I think a lot of people hadn't yet applied that here. So, um, I got a couple funny, funny looks with that, but what we ended up doing over the next couple of days was creating a path to selling a home if nobody was allowed to leave their house. Seller's not allowed to leave their house. Buyer's not allowed to leave their house. Nobody's allowed to leave their house. Um, we actually ran it through the board once it was put together and made sure that the attorneys there were okay with it. And, and it, it turned what would normally be a 60 day transaction period into 75 and all of the activities that would normally take place in the beginning will now take place at the end and give us two months to sell properties, get everything under contract with nobody being able to leave, um, leave their house. Now, luckily, thankfully that never happened, um, here. Um, but what it did do is give us the model before we ever stepped into this reality. It gave us the model of what it would look like worst case scenario. And then of course we had the model over here of what it looked like best case scenario, which is business as, as usual. So for me in each situation dealing with every single client, and this is what I'm driving home to all of our agents too, be flexible to fall somewhere in there. Seller one may want to be all the way over here. 
Seller two may want to be all the way back here. Keep safety paramount, but be open, be creative in every situation to, to put things together in a way that you never even thought of. Um, and when you have those bookends, business as usual, all the way over to full, you know, full incapacity from a functional standpoint going outside, that gives you a really wide range of things to use, which will make everybody comfortable in that process. Um, I say that because it's important you have that mindset first, right? To look at the whole span of options that you have and then be creative within the, the bookends of that process, as opposed to just blindly going in, having a conversation with somebody, they bring up a concern uh, or a transaction starts to get haywire because an issue comes up and you haven't quite thought through a process yet or what it could look like. So um, I say most importantly, guys, be as flexible as you can going through this. Um, it was not easy for me at first, uh, but the creativity started to make things happen that I said, wow, that would never happen before. It started to keep things together that that would never have stayed together before. Our, our instinct, our reaction is to, to grab something, squeeze it, hold on. Like I wanna, we gotta keep the buyer in this transaction. We gotta figure out a way to get it to the closing table where ironically now when people are in a fear mode, sometimes the best way to get it there is to let go. Let go, take a deep breath, take everything in, be as creative and be as flexible as possible. Do not get frustrated because everybody feels that and that alone could scare people away. Um, and just, just ride the wave. What comes out the other end is going to come out the other end. And last piece, I know I'm talking way too long on this one particular question, but don't be afraid to lose a transaction. Um, I said this from minute one going into this. Guys, uh, we built our business. My business partner, Ron Iosa, and myself really became who we were as realtors in our industry in the, in the first crash, right? When things came down in 2009. And our, our ability to stay focused, hyper-focused on pushing forward without the fear of losing things allowed us to blindly grow exponentially. Some stuff is gonna fall apart because of COVID. Come to peace with that. If you have a bad day and two transactions fall apart, come to peace with it. I get it. This is your living. This is, this is how you feed your family for many of us. But by allowing that to move us inside, that will cost you two more transactions tomorrow and potentially a whole career if you let that build up on you. And the mentality of being fluid could very well be the difference of those two transactions in two weeks coming back together, which we're now starting to see as opposed to handling it the wrong way and losing it for good. So those are just a couple of, couple of pieces that I'm stating going in as different strategies and being nimble. To, to get stuff started and get it to the closing line. Um, and it's the opposite of how we would usually handle it. Same question to you, Michelle. What are some new strategies or systems that you've implemented since COVID-19? I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. Um, a lot of, I agree with a lot of uh, what Bill mentioned, um, but the, I would say three things that I've definitely implemented since all of this has been this pre-screening, right? So we could just additional pre-screening, making sure that before there's a showing that I get on the phone or one of my team members gets on the phone with the agent, just to really make sure that the buyer is serious and they're not just looking and wasting time. Um, second, virtual showings. This is something obviously we didn't do before. So now we're implementing that, especially for those that are nervous about having people in the home. We uh, are virtually showing the home, uh, including you know virtual open houses and um, just virtual walkthroughs. And the third, you know, working from home remotely. I mean, Zoom calls, and I mean, that's something we didn't really do before. So staying at home, keeping up with current, with constant, um, with previous clients, current clients, your team, I'm a team leader, I run a team. So, you know, just face-to-face, -face, I'm also doing um, strategy sessions with team members individually on Zoom. So, you know, for an hour or two, a day. Um, I'm with them. I'm, I'm teaching them. I'm coaching them. We're going back and forth. So a lot of, a lot of virtual. Um, and I think, you know what, it, I, in the beginning too, I thought it was going to be hard because I'm, I'm a go-getter. I'm always, I like being outside and I like, you know, you know, the hustle of, of the business. Um, but, but, but we've adapted and, and here's what I predict. Uh, I also predict that 
now and or in the future, you're going to start seeing a lot of agents um, just, you know, working from home, you know? So I think those brick and mortar um, establishments are, are going to be, you know, are going to be up. They're not going to be as, as, as many anymore because people have adapted to all of this. Um, so those are my, my, my three changes. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to pass it along to our NC jar president elect Hiro. Wow, guys, uh, all the young professionals that are watching this. I mean, we've gotten a ton of information, uh, super, super, super knowledgeable individuals here. Again, we appreciate you guys for, for spending the time uh, to share with us what you guys are doing um, and, and being here for us. Um, I want to dive in a little bit uh, in particular to listings because you guys have an, a, an amazing amount of new listings that you've um, earned from the time that this has uh, come about. So Michelle, we can start with you. Um, you mentioned that you're doing 3D tours now with all your houses, Matterports. Um, you also mentioned you're doing virtual showings. Um, is there anything in addition to those things that you hadn't done before that you're implementing now? So, um, so the last couple of years, you know, digital marketing and virtual, this is something that we've adapted already to all of our listings. So the chain that we haven't really, you know, this isn't new to us. We didn't have to all of a sudden decide, okay, well, how do we get these homes uh, out there and exposed? I think the biggest difference is that is, is the targeting, right? So listen, anyone can go in and offer a 3D matter port. Anyone can offer a video. Anyone can offer uh, professional photography. Anyone can list it on Zillow. But how are you targeting those buyers? And that's the secret behind marketing is being able to target, right? So in, we have, in my team, for example, I have, I have a marketing team. I have a staff that just handles all our, you know, um, our SEO and, and um, our digital marketing, our targeted marketing, but that's more than anything more important. And I have found that the use of video actually goes a long way. So most people are most likely, um, uh, clicking on a video before they would click on a static image. And I have been really successful with video, but it's also the targeting behind it. So that make sure that when you're, you're, you're marketing these properties, you're not just, you know, putting these things on online, but how are you reaching these buyers and are you tracking them? Right? So all of my listings have um, a website and it's the personal website and it's, it's my website and it's, but it's, it's catered to, to each listing. And on the back end, I'm able to track, and measure the analytics, you know, who's, how, how many people are looking at it, where are they coming from, um, where, um, you know, uh, all the analytics on, on how many likes that I have this week, is it better on the weekends versus on the weekday? And then what I do is I take that all that data and then I double down. So if I'm finding that a particular listing is getting so many more views from people than say Jersey City, then on the next campaign, I'm doing a, uh, I'm putting more money into targeting those type of buyers. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's really what right now it's what we're focused on. And it's been very, very productive. So um, from a marketing approach, I just want to, uh, I want to offer a little caution to everybody and I, and everybody has to uh, always remember that different markets behave differently, right? So uh, one broker experiencing something in one market may be differently um, interpreted by, by one and another. Um, I'm, I'm expressing some caution in that I've watched this massive shift to, to digital spending, right? Um, and spending on the Matterports and the video tours and, um, you know, building, building websites, all, all kinds of craziness. Um, and that was actually my initial reaction too. So part of that conversation um, that I talked about when we said, what would it look like if nobody could leave their house? One of the thoughts we had was to Matterport everything we got by disposable VR, virtual reality glasses, brand them, have 300 of them sitting at the office. So if anybody wants to, we can let them digitally tour the, the property. Um, we, we, we thought through it and we looked into the MLS at the properties that we're actually selling. And, and a lot of those properties didn't have some of that flash and dazzle that, you know, that, that we've been really getting bombarded with from a, from a marketing perspective. I think that your, your Matterports, your digital targeting, all of those um, are, are functional pieces that they're very much geared toward what M Michelle had said before 
in that it's a it's a, a great lead gen piece that is in my mind in alignment with marketing you as an agent right showing that that you're moving with the times that you're doing things differently and there is a ton of validity to that um i also feel and some people will probably argue with me and i i may feel totally different tomorrow that we need to be very careful um on certain things i've seen a lot of agents get into to videoing um you know with these these razzle dazzle video tours that the house just doesn't look like it's supposed to right it, it doesn't look like it really does in real life and that is a danger that our industry has gone down this 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 kind of path for a while um and and the solution um or the danger in doing that is that they come into the house now you're driving traffic into a house during a time when that's really what you don't want to do based on false um expectations and and um, under expectations. I will tell you guys this as crazy as it sounds. And a lot of the newer agents are going to love this. Some of my most successful experiences with digital right now. Um, I got one into attorney review using this. It was, Hey, Mr. Seller, they're super nervous about letting anybody in the house, go outside, hold your video camera on your chest at chest level, not on your chest and walk through the house like a buyer would open the doors, open the closets and give me a separate video for each level and one for the outside. Send me those four videos. And I supplied that to a few buyers and agents um, that were interested in it. And they love it because it's real. It's a, it's a real video. It's a real walkthrough. It's not, um, you know, done up beautifully. And I will tell you if, if you're playing in the high end, this is, this is probably not something that you want to do, but you know, your, your twos, threes, four hundred thousands, giving a buyer the ability buyers automatically assume that stuff's getting dressed up right now. Um, and, and it is really important to connect with the buyer on the realm of reality. And I have found that these, these actual video tours done, by the sellers have been incredibly impactful. And then I can, we can invite them, hey, is there anything else you wanna see closer? Do you, you wanna see the utility room and the furnace? Let me know, we'll grab videos of that, um, saving a lot of that, that time going in. So um, we have spent time trying to do this individualized instead of mass. We've done some really cool videos. We've marketed them out there. Uh, I'm, I'm in full agreement, so I don't want this to sound like I'm in opposition with, with um, what was said before. I'm in full agreement with that from a marketing perspective, a lead gen perspective, um, and in, in many cases, connecting with a buyer that may be the perfect fit for, for a home. And that also um, goes for targeting the city, which is now um, a really, really good buyer pool to go after because of some of the uh, discomfort there. But I will tell you, you don't have to do this for everybody. Those of you who are operating on low budgets and be wise of your budgets right now too. It's really important too. Don't just go blowing every dollar you got on all kinds of video and, and stuff for, for a particular home if it's not going to be impactful in the actual selling process of that home. We got, we got two or three months ahead of us that you may not be feeling the impact of what happened yet. The last two months, we've closed what went under contract in January and February. And the next few months are when we're really going to experience what happened uh, in the initial phase of, of this COVID challenge. So be mindful of your expenses first when targeting what you're doing with marketing. If you go belly up, it's not helping anybody, especially your sellers. Um, but be purposeful with those dollars as well. Um, and, and, you know, like Michelle said, target, target people that are likely to purchase. So you're doing your job and opening that potential buyer pool, but don't go nuts. Don't get extravagant. Um, because a lot of the homes that are selling don't have, you know, um, feature film quality video tours going on in the, in the, in the properties in order to get it to the closing table for the most amount of money, which is really your main goal. So that's my advice on, on that. Absolutely. And thank you very much. And you guys heard it here. Both Michelle and Bill are talking about video, how important video is. Um, and again, if you don't, might not have that budget for the higher end video production, um, you have the option to, like Bill mentioned, um, have your client use the video, uh, the video camera on their cell phone. You know, cell phone cameras are, are phenomenal nowadays. Um, how are you handling the showings um, of those listings?
Um, so I think I might have answered that in the past. So a lot of, so the vacant homes are, are right now are amazing because the showings are easy. No one's living there. So vacant homes are by far um, the easiest and the, the ones that are actually selling the quickest. Um, if there are, the owners are occupied, you know, it's a matter of them just feeling comfortable. If they're not comfortable, we do a lot of pre-screening. Um, we make sure that they check out all of the the, the, the virtual tours and 3D Matterports and all the technology and everything that we have in place um, before they commit to a showing. And, um, and then we just, again, you no more than I'd say one to two people at a time, we're limiting that, um, practicing social distancing, our agents are wearing masks, they're wearing gloves, they're the ones responsible for turning on lights and uh, in case the seller doesn't do that. And, you know, and then the seller's coming back and just sanitizing it. So we're just using precaution. It's been, it's been uh, really, really productive. And, um, and we've, we've, it, it's been productive. And we've, we've actually closed, you know, significant amount of, of sales just by practicing these procedures because everyone knows their place. Um, our team is educated. They understand how, you know, how, how they need to handle every showing. At the end of the day, it's more about protecting, you know, protecting the seller, protecting the buyer, protecting yourself. So a lot of protection, um, but a lot of screening uh, beforehand as well. Uh, Bill, you answered earlier um, how you're having everybody do the booties, uh, uh, gloves, the masks. Um, is there anything new that you're doing to handle those showings? Um, for right now, no. I mean, I think the way that, that Michelle answered was was right on point. I think the only thing I would add is at the beginning, just from a challenge perspective, a lot of your sellers are going to be, and we've kind of talked through this too, initially apprehensive about, about the safety involved. Your ability to practice and script how you're going to handle showings and your ability to deliver that to them in a way that makes them feel comfortable might be the difference of you getting a listing or not. It might be the difference between them selling their house or not. So, um, you know, for, for a lot of people, the decision is to wait until they get an opportunity to work on it. And we're like the only business on this planet, I think, that does that commonly. Um, I always say like, how would you feel if your surgeon started practicing the day that you got rolled into to the OR, right? That would be a dangerous, um, you know, task at hand. Um, so for us, we, we script a lot with um, what if scenarios, how we're talking through these objections, not in a way to convince somebody to do something they don't want to do, but in a way to deliver information. Like I could tell Michelle has delivered that a bunch of times and a bunch of times to sellers and the way she does it makes somebody who starts off here like, oh my God, I need to sell, but the, how am I going to let people in my house? and finish here, like, okay, that actually makes a ton of sense. It looks like there's a whole bunch of precautions put in place to make sure that, that we're safe, right? Um, one last piece that I do add in is that for whatever it's worth, um, we do mandate with, with your agreement that a buyer would sign a document coming in that states that they, nor anyone they've been in contact with, have experienced any COVID symptoms um, within the last two weeks, right? So that's just an extra checkpoint in saying that um, there's some, and, and you'll get some of that, oh yeah, but anybody's gonna sign that. And I said, believe it or not, it's actually created a few situations in our world where people have raised questions and said, well, actually their mother who lives in the house does have COVID, but they don't. And then it's the seller's um, choice whether they allow them to come in the house or not or they had COVID, but now they tested clear and they go back to work on Monday. Um, and that allows us to deliver that back. The seller hearing that um, makes them feel a lot more comfortable that there's at least one more checkpoint where somebody you know, should be at least screened on paper as to whether this is something they're walking around with or not. Thank you, Bill. So, so what we're hearing here, and, and you both mentioned it earlier, right? A lot of sellers are being hesitant. One of the things Michelle said was education is key on that, right? Once you educate them with the information that we know, the safety precautions that we're using, then that's where the hesitancy kind of comes down a little bit. And then you're able to show them like, listen, business is still happening. We're still able to um, get your home sold and things like that. So, so once again, thank you guys for sharing. Uh, not only on the consumer side, but also on the agent side. Like we also need to take that initiative and educate ourselves on how we can be better and how we can help those people that need our help. Thank you again, guys. Um, so I have one more question for both of you. So if we can start with uh, Michelle, um, the question I have for you. So I'm sure a lot of people are having this issue, um, but I want to get your perspective. What are some of the obstacles you're having now 
um, in regards to the closing process? Um, so I think a, a lot of buyers are using COVID-19 as an, an ex, I shouldn't say an excuse, but as a way of trying to get sellers um, to be more negotiable, either on their purchase price or if they're already in contract and we're approaching a closing, you know, during final walkthrough, I'm seeing uh, buyers just try to get as much money as they can from these sellers and they're, you know, they're, they're using this to their advantage. Um, so I've also seen um, some buyers just completely, you know, um, uh, just back out. And while they're in, I mean, I'm talking about in contract, out of attorney review, done with inspection, done with appraisal, and then just say, nope, I'm not closing, um, you know, and due to COVID-19, I'm not closing, I'm nervous, but not. And I'm seeing a lot of attorneys kind of let them off the hook. I mean, that's that's what I'm seeing. They're not just really being strong and, and holding them to their to their contract because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, once you go into a contract, there's a contract, is there's a there's a contract for a reason. You can't just unilaterally decide to walk away. So that's what I've been experiencing, I would say, the biggest challenge in closing so far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's been popping up. Uh, uh, we too have experienced buyers trying to get out. Um, I feel that a lot of the reasoning behind that is based on false understanding, which is why I've been such a proponent of us educating the agent community as well as the, the, the buyers and stuff as to both sides of this, how it could play out. So somebody who needed a house two months ago, got this house, now looks at this and says, maybe I'm overpaying. Um, perhaps if somebody truly explained to them that in two months, they might have to pay 10, 15 grand more for the same house, they might not be so quick to back out. So um, educating and coaching um, the other side through, I found to be really important. I've also found again, and I'm, I'm repeating myself because these concepts are, are fluid, they go, they go throughout. The more we try to hold on, when a buyer says in their mind, look, I'm nervous, I might want to get out of this, I don't want to be you know, driven into this purchase right now. Um, when that decision has been made, if we try to be more restrictive on them, uh, it, it, in most cases, it's going to make it worse, right? People in fear and panic mode do not respond well to direction. You're right, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I want to be a little more specific, if I may. Uh, and, and this answer is going to vary, which is why I want to bring this up, uh, depending on where you operate, where you practice real estate, because every town has their own uh, uh, rules and regulations. So, uh, Michelle, if I may, are you seeing any issues in particular to uh, COs or appraisals, for example? No, actually, we've been pretty good. We haven't really had any issue. I mean, COs are being done. I think now in our area, they're actually, um, um, they're, they're, you know, they're making sellers sign, sign a form so, affidavit. or an affidavit. Yeah, so that's actually been, been easy. Um, as far as appraisers and appraisals, we haven't had any challenges. I mean, when I price homes, I also price them correctly. I price them to sell um, for the most part. Um, unless the seller obviously is is not really motivated or unrealistic, but for the most part, I mean, when we have when we appraise a home, we're pretty accurate. So um, homes are selling and closing um, for for contract value. So I have to say, my experience maybe I just had a I'm just lucky or I had a great experience, but I haven't had any any deals fall apart at all due to a CO or inspections or you know appraisals. So we 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 found for the most part the CO process to be easier. We have run into a couple of situations that became challenging where essentially the town wants to um, give a TCO, meaning more or less they're gonna, they're gonna do the CO inspection later. And the, the challenge then becomes buyer versus seller, right? Does the buyer want to purchase this property now and assume what could be, I mean, you, you take a town like Wayne for instance, um, has probably one of the most difficult uh, CO processes um, just because they're really particular about things. You know, it could run thousands in repairs uh, based on the CO. So when a buyer says, okay, cool, let me close, uh, 
that there's some assumed risk in there too. So we've had a couple situations where we've actually had to have conversations about creating escrow accounts um, for post-closing COs so that they would have the ability to go back and, and pull some money if that were in fact the case. But for the most part, it actually has been an easier process. Um, you know, there can be a little volatility in there, but more so now than ever, focus on the education side before the appraisal happens talk through what both things that could happen with your potential client so that they're prepared for that if it under appraises as a buyer if it under appraises as a seller they've logically thought through how they would or could or should handle it as opposed to oh my god it just slapped me in the face now i have to put my back up and respond in the moment so i would just say take that little extra time and and coach coach through every part of the process that could go wrong explain it what used to take minutes for the last couple months has probably taken me an hour and a half through my conversations conversations have stretched much longer because everybody wants to talk through and hear it and i'm good with that because the more i prepare them the more they're going to be prepared um if something pops up thank you again so um what i heard you just say is set the expectation up front right um and we all know you know we have so many, uh, such a vast dichotomy between uh, what can possibly happen and what happens. So inform them at the end of the day. On my end, thank you guys greatly. David, you did a great job, everyone here. You guys did a great job making this come through. Take it away, brother. Thank you everyone to my fantastic team, Gavin, Hiro, Chrissy, I appreciate it. Michelle and Bill, we really appreciate you coming on this call. I hope all our viewers took a lot away from this. Uh, just for our viewers, just know the industry is changing. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we have to adapt considering the situation we're in. Um, so with all the tools you've gathered today and all the information, we wanna have a call to action to you to go out and get a listing. All right, guys. Have a great one. Bye-bye.